Good morning, everyone. How are you? Awesome. Good. Don't mind this. I um, lug this sucker around with me everywhere I go in life, don't you? Everybody have something like this, some baggage they carry with you? Yep, let's see if we can get up here, right? Nope. Ugh. Sometimes our baggage gets too heavy. Yes? Yes? It's going to be loud. Boom. There we go. We'll use that in a minute. We are in halfway through spring, br spring break. Is it? Yes, it's spring break in my house, which is awesome. Um, for our kids, we have not, um, three of them, we didn't get to spend their entire lives with them. So these huge two-week chunks are really good chunks for us to like regroup as a family. But last Sunday, 5 o'clock, Joe's cutting hair. And um, one child who has been complaining for a while, one of our kids, that his head's been itching. And so we've looked, why is your head itching, and we've not ever seen anything. So Joe cuts his hair, and I look, and there are bugs in his head. He has lice. So we get to start off spring break with a good case of lice. Thankfully, no one else has it. Um, but I thought it was really fitting coming into this topic for this week because... As I'm picking out all of these bugs out of its hair, and it turns into this three-hour endeavor, which then again yesterday I had to go through it all again, um, it can feel really like a waste of time for something that has to be done, right? Kind of like Vic and Clint were out there putting salt on the parking lot this morning so it wouldn't be slippery, which thank you for that. But at the same time, we have those moments where we're like, it's just going to melt later, why do I have to put the effort into it right now? And we all have these life things that we're like, why do I have to work so hard at this? And so I'm pulling out all these bugs and stuff, and everybody's heads are probably itching right now because that's just what happens. And um, as I'm pulling it out, piece by piece by piece by piece by piece, um, it started to come to me like how foolish it would be if I started like yelling at him and getting angry at him, how dare you, you know, why did you put these bugs in your head? It's not like he went and picked them up, right? He doesn't know where he got them from. It's also foolish for me as a parent to allow those things to stay on him because it impacts his life, right? He's, he's itchy. It impacts his ability to relate to others because people don't want to be around people who got bugs in their hair. And it impacts his relationship with me because even though I love my son dearly, I'm probably not going to cuddle as close to him as I would if he didn't have the bugs in his hair, right? And this is kind of our mental process. This is our brain, if you will. And when we come to faith in God, and we, um, whether you're, you've been at it a long time or you're new to faith with him and you're like, okay, so... God loves me as I am, right? I'm his son, I am his daughter, I'm here, bugs and all, baggage and all, I am here. And then at some point along the way, he's like, hey, so I've been noticing, you got some stuff in your hair we got to get out, right? And we come acro across these crucial points in our faith over and over and over again, and you will until the day you die. It's not um, a symbol of, you're a failure or you're not far along in your faith or you have failed or made the wrong choice. It's simply, we've got junk in our lives. And because he wants us to thrive, he wants us to thrive in our relationships with others and he wants us to be able to thrive in our relationship with him, he's going to keep bringing up the same things over and over and over again because he's a God who loves us because he's a God who wants the best for us. But I don't know about you, but I don't really like it when he gets into my business sometimes. <laughs> I'll be like, you can look at all these things, but not this stuff. So one of our children, then I have to go through everyone's hair, and um, so I'm going through another child's hair, pulling, looking, you know, and you have to go through the same process just to make sure. And this child was like screaming like he was dying because he's got a really sensitive head. And it's just like this whole ordeal. And at the same time, we do that too. We don't want God touching us, even if we've been infected or impacted by someone else's stuff. It's not my fault. 
but it still has an impact on our lives, right? So the verse that I wanted to look at for this morning was um, John, I'll just stay over here so I'm not bouncing around, sorry about that. Um, John 14, and this is, um, Jesus is talking to his disciples. It's after Palm Sunday, which is today. And um, he's telling his disciples, he's kind of telling them what's going to happen, what's going to come, because God, again, is a proactive God who he sees the things that are coming, and he wants to speak into us to equip us for those things. And so John 14, verse 25 says, I'm telling you these things while I'm still living with you. The friend... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send at my request, will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all the things I have told you. I'm leaving you well and whole. That's my parting gift to you, peace. I don't leave you the way you're used to being left, feeling abandoned, bereft. So don't be upset. Don't be distraught. What he's saying is, Jesus is going to go. He knows he's going to go. Palm Sunday, everybody's celebrating, saying, yes, the son of David is here, the Messiah is here, isn't this great? And he's like, I'm just going to be leaving pretty soon, and you're going to be really down in the dumps about it. But I'm giving you a gift, and this is the Holy Spirit that's going to be in you, and the Holy Spirit is what guides us and what teaches us. And, um, but the problem is, is that we come at our faith, we, we got like all kinds of files, in here, and we have filing systems, and this is how God made our brains to be, so this doesn't mean that we're bad and evil because our brains work this way. I am picky about food, so when I see a certain type of food, my brain goes, does that fit in with the foods I like or the foods I don't like? I don't like to be adventurous. It files it in a certain place, right? And it goes in my little filing cabinet. Sure, sometimes I should step out of my zone and be more adventurous. Not everything in the filing cabinet is bad, okay? But God wants to address the process of why we go about filing things to even begin with. About a month or so ago, I woke up and um, some child did something. They're always doing something, right? But some kid did something first thing in the morning. And um, instantly, I feel this nudge from the Spirit. And he's like, are you going to choose to hold on to that or not? And I'm like, I don't know. It's like 6 in the morning. I don't just move past it, right? So then we go on to the next thing. And um, a little bit later in the day, again, there was again this like nudging of why are, why are you choosing to not hold on to this? And I was like, wait, I'm not holding on to it. Why are you questioning me, God? Like, what, what does this have to do with this? He's not always concerned about the baggage that we're carrying around. The baggage, the behaviors, the attitudes, that's the external stuff. And that always gets taken care of if we're attuned to the spirit if we're allowing him to sift through our process. And as this specific day went on, a day where we just want to like push it aside and say, I don't want to address these things, God kept bringing up situation after situation after situation. Rachel, what's your thought process? Why are you choosing to hold on to this thing? Why are you choosing to let go of this thing? I don't know, right? Well, because sometimes I have the right to feel indignant about something. Sometimes I have the right to be gracious to someone, right? Because then I have the upper hand in it. We have all these reasons why we choose to file things in our brain. But because God is proactive and because God is loving and because he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit, he doesn't like to deal with these things in times of high stress, high tension, high drama. Do you know why? Because our brains are shut down during those times. That's how he designed brains to be. We go into fight, fight, flight, freeze mode. And your brain can't process it anyway. So just like it's futile with a child in the middle of a huge tantrum to be like, now take your deep breaths right now and count down from 10. No one's going to do that in the middle of a tantrum. At our house, we have to practice a whole lot where we do counting down from 10 in all these really positive situations. So then their little brain neurons have already connected. So then when they have the tantrum, they're already equipped to do it. Does that make sense? So when we have moments of high tension and high stress, 
That's not the time where he is addressing our heart issues. That's not the time where he's addressing our process. So when we're in really calmer times, really mellow times, and the Spirit starts bringing up stuff, we're like, there's no problem here right now, God. Why do we need to talk about this? And he's like, because I am a proactive, loving, and a good God who wants you to be equipped for when these things come up. Does that make sense? And the thing with the Holy Spirit is, is that, I'm going to get to these files in a minute, but the Holy Spirit is over here wanting to address our every moment, our every situation, our every interaction with a a very unique lens that only the Holy Spirit can give to it, okay? When we come at it with our files and our baggage and our systems of how we process things, we then say we love God and we love how he brings healing and we love um, you know, his promises and all these different things, yet we aren't actually acting in a way that trusts him because we're still defaulting to our method of how we process life. And this was the problem on Palm Sunday is because everybody's in there and everybody's so excited, but then Jesus knows the very next week when everybody's in this really high, tense, riled up, stressful situation, everybody then defaults to our religious tendencies, our racist tendencies, our emotional tendencies, and all these things, instead of standing in with the Holy Spirit and saying, what is unique in this moment, in this time, in this place? Does that make sense? So when Jesus says, I came to you of life to the full, take on my yoke that's light and easy, this is not a light and easy yoke. Walking with the Holy Spirit in every moment is because he's proactive and he's good. And then there's a whole process of learning to get there. And so our our faith, our relationship with God starts off with God loves us, and then we have to keep saying, am I going to walk around with bugs in my hair all the time, or do I want to have a clean head? Do I want to carry all these files with me all the time, or do I want to walk in freedom? Freedom can be a scary place to walk because you don't always know what's going to happen next. You do not know who he's going to make you forgive. You do not know what he's going to ask you to let go of. And then we want to come back here to our files, and then we say, but God, don't you see the proof that I have about something? Yes? So I was driving by, I was trying to think of examples, and um, driving by the other day, um, down 36, and there was a homeless person on the corner. I thought, oh, this is a good low-hanging fruit one that we can talk about. Oh, my throat's dry. Um, So, yell out, when you see a homeless person on the corner, what comes to mind? Don't feel guilty. Yell it out. Crickets? What? Are they really? Yeah. Are they really? That's a really popular one. Yeah. He, he's on a cell phone, so why does he need it? How are they going to use the money? Yep. These are all things that come to mind, right? And so we have our filing system that our brain instantly goes to. You pull up. And instantly, whether you are the most gracious, kind, giving person in the world, even if you give in that moment, you're probably going to think, and you see none of those other cars did. I'm just so giving, right? Um, Or your brain is like the most, like, this is my money, don't touch me, don't look at me, you're going to take me type thing, and you lock your cars in an inconspicuous way because you don't want to, like, hurt their feelings, right? Anybody done that before? So we look at their clothes, we look at the sign. Is the sign nicely written? but you don't want it to be too nicely written. I want it to give to somebody who kind of knows the English language, but maybe not so much that they, you know, they have a degree in something, right? And our brain goes through all of these things, and do they have a lot of food with them? Do they have a dog with them? Because maybe I'll give more if they have a dog with them than it's just them. Are they deserving or not is what it comes down to. But the Holy Spirit is over here saying, I want you to live a free life. Easy. So you know who knows the ins and outs of that person's life? The Holy Spirit. Do you know who knows the ins and outs of my life? The Holy Spirit. Do you know who knows who else is going to be driving on this road later today? The Holy Spirit. And so if we can get into the practice where we pull up, we see somebody, and our default response is not our system, 
and it'll come up. And then you say, you know what, I'm going to release it. What are you telling me, Jesus? And then he'll say, you know what? In this moment, at this time, for this person, maybe give them a couple bucks. At this time, at this moment, for this person, you can drive on by because I'm God and I'm greater than this and I know who's coming next who will help them. And then you can drive off not feeling guilty and not feeling judgmental because you've chosen to entrust to God. Does that make sense? It's hard to get into the habit of doing that. And it does not come in high stress times, right? This is the pattern of the practice of what he wants to do in us. So when you're driving down the street and you feel the Spirit say, hey, look over at the person on the side of the road, feel free to look over and then make it a practice of prayer to release back to him and say, and what should my response be? This is where that whole our thoughts and prayers will be with you thing falls short because people just say it flippantly instead of actually saying, okay, Holy Spirit, what do you want for this situation? If we follow that through all the way, Prayers always lead to action. It may not just, just might not be action in that very moment, if that makes sense. This comes up too with things like money. That's fun, right? We got filing cabinets full of our views on money. How you were raised impacts that. Your views on taxes impacts it. If you have money in the bank, it impacts it. If you, um, and we have all these really great reasons and thinking behind it, which are fine. But at the end of the day, when he says, do not be lovers of money, he's saying, is your thoughts, your approaches, your theories on finances submitted to the Holy Spirit in his process? And so in any given moment, are you free to say, okay, he prodded me to pay for someone's groceries. He did not prod me to pay for someone's groceries. You don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to feel judgmental. Because he doesn't want us living under those things. But then in times of high stress, when everyone around us is frantic or upset, or the bills aren't coming through, or you've had 18 things break in your house, and then we default to our previous thought systems. We default to our scarcity mindset. We default to how things were before. And so he wants to challenge those things in our life. One of our kids, um, there's a park near here that last summer we were at, he got stung by like five wasps. So this year we went when it was a bit, you know, cooler, there's no bugs out, and um, he hit his head, same child, like eight times. So he's like, this park is of the devil, and I am never going there again. He said, it's not adventure park, it's danger park. I said, well, yeah, I hear ya. But, so his little file folder, starts when we're kids, says, don't go to that park because that park is dangerous. And if we allow our kids, or if we allow ourselves, to keep putting those files into this file folder, by the time he's a teenager or grown-up, he's going to have a whole agenda against wooden parks if we let him do that. So we're talking a lot about places don't have power over you and maybe how can we be careful, you know, all these different things. And there's a difference, though, between, this is something we're also talking with our kids about, the Holy Spirit giving you those feelings in your belly and you know something's not a safe place. That's different than having a list of reasons why you're not going to go somewhere. There's a lot of places in our city that people won't step into, not because the Holy Spirit's telling them to not go there, but because they got file folders. I didn't have old computer paper that, you know, goes... They got file folders that are miles long of what they've heard, what they've seen. And then the Holy Spirit, though, is like, hey, guys, didn't I conquer death, right? (laughs) Like, why are we so worked up about things that we have an agenda about, but the Holy Spirit doesn't care? Because you know what? Being 
in the presence of God is the ultimately safest place you will ever be. And so if the presence of God says, stay away from a place, then you stay away from it. But if the presence of God says, go into the place, it doesn't matter if it's the most war, to- war zone-ish place in the world, the presence of God is with you and the protection of God is with you. But the problem is, is that we are a people who are so fixated on the promises of God, right? The abundance of God and the safety of God and the new life that God gives us that we aren't people of the presence of God. So I asked some experts, can we put that video up? Some experts to tell us what the presence of God really is. So what does it mean to be in the presence of God? Um, it feels super, super great. Oh my I God. love it. Oh I just God. love it. Can you describe it? Like, I like it very much. <laughs> so that steps up to loving me. Anything to add, Javon? Yeah. Oh my God. Your brain still loves you no matter what. Don't give up. What the? When we think about the presence of God, we don't actually know what it is. We're like, I like it. And that's like two steps up to loving it, which doesn't mean anything, right? Like, what does that mean? Sounds cool. Unfortunately, a lot of times, church, we are like the people on Palm Sunday. And we are like, Hosanna, the king is here. He has come. Look, proof of the promises, right? They have waited. The Jewish people had waited thousands of years, right? We can't wait like 10 days for something. They've waited thousands of years, and they are celebrating this like, Hosanna, Hosanna, he has come. Our promises are finally coming to fruition. But he never asked them to be a people of his promises. He asked them to be a people of his presence. Because if they were a people of his presence, then it wouldn't have mattered that he went on the cross because they still would have stuck with it because the presence of God was walking in that direction. And the struggle that we have is that when we, here's one of our other folders, promises. What does abundance look like to you? I would like it to look like a mansion and a creek and a pool in my backyard. Does my husband Hello. Awesome. Not today. Okay. So I, you know, have a dream property that I would love to have. And when I get restless and claustrophobic in my house and I'm like, oh my gosh, we just need a bigger space. And I said, Joe, I found the perfect house. There's a creek. There's a pool. We won't ever have to go anywhere ever again. And he looked at me because you want someone who will be honest. And he said, I love you. But if we're going anywhere, it's going to move further downtown. And I was like, oh, but I want the creek in my backyard. I want the abundance of God, right? What does that mean to us? What does this protection mean to us? We have these assumptions that play out, but we forget, though, that in order to get to those places of promise, we have to walk in the footsteps of his presence. Can we put up that other picture, please? So I felt like I needed to share this. I don't normally share personal prophetic things for my family, but um, this is for one of my kids. Um, And this is what the proactive loving heart of God looks like for one of my children. Um, She, early on, Um, for a long time of her life, will be kind of in an infant mode. She is not an infant. She is an older child. But this is what life has served her. And so a lot of her connection and her nurturing needs are stuck at this level. Then she will progress. She will grow. And she'll move up kind of that toddler bed stage where there's some independence and there's um, 
learning her own abilities and all of those things, that exciting newness to life. And then she'll have a time where she um, returns to like a sleeping bag, reflective of their early homelessness and neglect, because she's going to have to go through and her brain's going to have to relearn what satisfies and what works and what doesn't. And then from there, uh, she'll progress to a grown-up sized bed and have thriving and stability. Now you can say, well, pray against that time. And yes, but that's not how life works because God's good and loving. He says, this is what's coming. And if we're a people of promise, we'll be all the way up here holding out for that time and we're cheering along all the growth along the way. Look at that. She's growing. She's growing. Isn't this amazing? Isn't God good? Isn't he so awesome? And then when she goes into this season, whether it's metaphoric or actual, of homelessness, of um, not getting any of her needs met, and then in those moments, and then we'll say, where is God? He has left us. When he's already spoken to it. He's already said this is what's going to happen. And so your job as parents in that season for her is not to chastise all her behaviors and not to correct every little thing she does, but to just simply be the presence of grace and love in her life so then she can move on to her place of promise. But we get hung up in these seasons because we weren't actually listening to begin with to find out what those desert seasons are, what those hard parts are. Jesus is telling them, and they don't believe him. He's saying, guys, I'm going to leave for a while. I'm going to die, and you're going to watch me. He's proactive. He tells us these things because he knows that the promises are on the other side of it. And we have everything we need in us to be equipped with this. And yes, it requires learning. And yes, it requires listening. And yes, it requires a whole lot of messing up along the way. But he wants us to be a people fixated on his presence more than we are attached to his promises. Because when you are a person of the presence of God, He is going to take you on some weird journeys to some weird places of his heart. Because he doesn't want us carrying around all this baggage. This even applies to a lot of, um, there's a folder here somewhere about truth. And God is truth. And God possesses all truth. And there's a lot of things that are morally truthful, theologically truthful. But at times, we've held on to our file folders of truth over the presence of God. And I'm going to explain that because I know it sounds weird. No, God is not saying he's against himself or anything like that. But if we can entrust that God is actually sovereign over theology, if God is actually sovereign over behaviors, and if he is trying to lead you on a faith journey to understand other perspectives and other understandings in life, he will then, if you're entrusting the Holy Spirit, will guide you full circle back to that place of truth. But if you're with a greater understanding and perspective and ache and brokenness and love for other people, But if we're so stuck in our place holding on to our file folder of truth saying, but you said this was truth, God. We miss out on all parts of that journey and all parts of his heart. And we honestly are just reflecting the unwillingness to trust within us. Which that's hard. That's really hard. There's been times in the past two years where there's been situations that have come up that I'm like, okay, I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying this, and yet I, I'm not quite sure how it all fits up, and I'm just going to have to trust that you are going to bring this full circle, God, because, again, if we say that's who he is, then we can entrust him to do that. When Jesus came in, 
to Jerusalem. And he's coming in, riding on this donkey and, um, for Palm Sunday, and they're celebrating him. And He knows that it's all the precursor. He knows that what they're celebrating in that moment isn't actually the celebration to be had. Last summer, I was sitting outside watching a storm roll in, and um, the air got really thick with the humidity, you know? You could, like, cut it with a knife. It was that thick, and you see the thunder in the distance, or you don't see the thunder. My gosh. You see the lightning in the distance, and you hear the thunder, and you see all the clouds rolling in. And um, a lot of times, we get caught up in the experience of God, But the problem is, similarly to a storm, it would be foolish of me to say, oh my gosh, wasn't that the best storm ever? When it's just the humidity in the air. It's just the sounds that are far off. Because that's not the actual storm. That's the indicator of the storm that's coming. That's the indicator of the rainfall that's coming. But even the rain, when it does fall, is not the growth. It's not the life in and of itself. And so when we find ourselves in a place where we're like, I just haven't had that experience of God lately. He wants us to be a people who are after the presence of God, which means we have to hold through any buildup of feeling, of experience, whether in worship, whether in your quiet time, whether any other time that you have, and we have to be a people who are willing to push through that and wait through that and wait through the storm, wait through the rain, because the presence of the Spirit is only indicated by the fruit that grows. It's not indicated by the rainfall. Yes, sure, the Spirit's falling, but is there actually fruit from it? Is there actually unity? If not, It fell on ground that wasn't absorbing. Is there peace? Is there love? Are there all these things that the Spirit is wanting to do in us, right? And we have to be a people who will hold out for that, which means we have to be a people who will allow God to go through all of our files. I think this is the biggest challenge for us as a church because for the most part, we're a group of people who, you know, we kind of have it all together. We have hard things and challenges um, because of life. But as long as we are um, keeping any of these in our stash and not allowing the Holy Spirit to sift through them, It's a declaration. It's a statement of, I don't really trust you, God. And we have to be willing to release each and every thing that the Spirit brings up, no matter if we think it's important or not. And that's hard, and that requires courage, and that requires um, a lot of trust, a lot of trust. So we're going to look at, um, just real quickly, before we wrap up. Sorry, I forgot where Galatians is. It's in there somewhere, right? Okay. Here we are. So at the end of Ephesians or Galatians 5, Paul tells them, it's absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time at all, you will be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? My counsel is this. 
live freely, animated and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with a free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are antithetical, so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? What he's saying is, it doesn't matter how legit or how much of a right I have to hold on to a thought process that I have. The heart of someone who is after the heart of God is a constant search me and sift me. Regardless of how certain I am on something, regardless of how confused I am on something, regardless of how much it means to my family or my culture or my identity, we have to constantly be in a position of search me and know me, God. Because he says the self-interest is antithetical. It goes against any moving of the Spirit. And because God is loving, because he is thorough, because he is jealous for every part of us, he will not stop prodding on things until he gets all the bugs out, until he gets all the files sifted and sorted through. And every single time, that is our chance. That's our, it's called a sacrifice of praise that we offer up to him because that is a better act of praise than any song you can sing on a Sunday morning is to say, yes, search me in this. Search me in this, God. I know you just searched something yesterday and I'm kind of tired of it, but search this thing again. Didn't we just go over this last week? Yep, okay, search it again and show me where your presence is, is in this, God. Because then we don't get caught up on Palm Sunday and then we get caught off guard by Easter. But we can step into those hard times and we step into those really challenging times knowing that the promise is on the other side of it. And knowing that as long as I am in the presence of God, I'm in the best place to be. I said that was the last thing, but it's not. Psalm 91. There's this concept of being safe under the shadow of God's wing. And um, he doesn't ever say that he's taking us out of the hard things. But he says, you who sit down in the high God's presence, you spend the night in Shaddai's shadow. Say this, God, you are my refuge. I trust in you and I'm safe. That's right. He rescues you from hidden traps, shields you from deadly, deadly hazards. His huge, outstretched arms protect you. Under them, you are perfectly safe. His arms fend off all harm. Fear nothing, not wild wolves in the night, not flying arrows in the day. Do you notice he doesn't say, I'm taking you and putting you on a high mountaintop where no one can touch you? No, he says, there's these dangers all around, yet you are untouchable. Not disease that prowls through the darkness, not disaster that erupts at high noon. Even though others succumb all around, drop like flies right and left, no harm will even graze you. You will stand untouched, watching it from a distance, watching the wicked turn into corpses. Yes, because God is your refuge, the high God, your very own home. Not how you process things, not how you secure yourself with what feels good or is safe. Evil can't get close to you. Harm can't get through the door. He ordered his angels to guard you wherever you go. If you stumble, they'll catch you. Their job is to keep you from falling. You'll walk unharmed among lions and snakes and kick young lions and serpents from the path. Even the cute ones. If you'll hold on to me for dear life, says God, I'll get you out of any trouble. I'll give you the best of care. If you'll only get to know and trust me, call me and I'll answer be at your side in bad times. I'll rescue you, then throw you a party. I'll give you a long life and give you a long drink of salvation. We have every promise of protection and security and thriving as long as we stay in the presence of God.
Father, we thank you for your constant pursuit of us. Even when we keep defaulting back to carrying around what we feel safe with, Father, I thank you for the abundance of your grace and that um, you are constantly available for us just to step into you. We don't have to make it right. We don't have to make it look right. We don't have to clean through these files ourselves. I pray that we'll have the courage that we can be a people who um, willingly surrender when you prod. We don't have to move one step further than you. We don't have to do a whole house cleaning all by ourselves because then that's just trying to prove ourselves and that doesn't work either. pray that we can come into this time of communion, God, just thinking on, do I hold out more for your promises or do I hold out for your presence? If all I had was the presence of the Lord, would it be enough? Thank you that you walk into our times of celebration that we don't even understand the implications of. And you're like, oh, but this isn't the good stuff, guys. But you still wait because you're patient for us. I pray a peace over those right now who feel just isolated, even in a room of people that... um, that they can hear and see your presence is with them. That you aren't asking anyone to hide. 